Welcome to this week's Cool Tools Show and Tell. We have a fantastic guest this week, Brian Lamb. Brian, would you introduce yourself? Tell us in sure. a second or two why you're here. My name's Brian, and I founded The Wire Cutter, which eventually got sold to the New York Times. I started it just with my friends, and uh, we just did really in-deep reviews. Maybe you've heard of it by now. I don't know. It's always weird. I guess a lot of people use it now. Uh, but I, I haven't been involved for five the, years. I use it all the time. I use it all the time. It's basically, it was cool tools done as an adult instead of as a hobby. It was like the cool tools done better. And um, it was a brilliant idea. Um, and I think that um, the basic idea of doing in-depth, showing your work and coming back to a tool and kind of reiterating on that was absolutely Fantastic, a brilliant idea, and it really does make one of the best um, sites to go for for tools. So I appreciate um, you saying that. Yeah, but I no. feel like cool tools is more my style now. To be honest, I've gotten a lot. <laughs> yeah. I've gotten a lot less intense about my tool research, and I feel yeah. like uh, a big portion of wire cutter is harnessing anxiety about the world being unsafe mm. and making the world safer through having really great tools that will not let you down right and right. how much is that anxiety worth dissipating well it's worth a lot of work right you can really make it find stuff that will never let you down right. that's valuable to someone who's you know basically got a lot of anxiety so it's just one of those observations i've made as time yeah. has gone on and you know i've gotten to be more of a uh, honestly cool tools person than a than a wire cutter person to be honest i couldn't do that research now the way my head is i'm just like eh. Yeah. It'll work. It'll be It'll fine. Work. Yeah. 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 Um, that's, that's true. There is um, um, an advantage in both. And um, mm. I'm glad that both of them are here. Let me put it that way. So, um, mm. so, so yeah, you um, have, you know, always had some affinity for gear and stuff. Mm. What's, what's a tool recently that you were kind of uh, enthusiastic about? What, okay. What's a tool you want to share? So at Wirecutter, the New York Times, I wasn't really helping run anything and I needed a hobby. So I picked up making espresso and I hadn't even really been a serious coffee drinker. And I learned a bunch of stuff through time, right? I did a bunch of research, of course, and I found a machine that was like the first Wirecutter pick. It was like a Breville. It's a pretty good machine, actually. I'd still be happy using it. Um, and I just tried a lot of coffee and I got some barista training. And I got into it. I got really into it. And then I just realized some things that beginners make mistakes on is that they pay way too much attention to the machine and really get for beans you like. And then manage your water. Coffee is mostly water. And oh. people don't really know that. Unless you're an enthusiast, you don't know that coffee does not like really clean water and machines don't like really dirty water. And so, what people do instead of managing every locale's water to be just right is that they strip down water to, you know, if you're serious about coffee, you use reverse osmosis, you get it to be perfectly empty. But if you make coffee with empty water, there are components of coffee that need to bind the things. Oh. And if those things aren't there, the coffee can taste very flat and dead. Oh. And it's almost like a lacking, lacking of like umami, right? Yeah. Wow. And salt. So what people do is they take all the way down and they basically remineralize it. And I need to send you a link for this, but I thought of just mentioning this. There's this product called third wave water and you add it to empty water. It could be distilled bottled water or reverse osmosis or even like really well filtered clean water. And it will just add back the minerals that won't cause scale in your machine, but they will increase the flavor. And I've done side by sides and it's incredible. It's really a, a really great thing. If you like coffee, you just add this to your water in a kettle for pour over or espresso, and it's terrific. Uh, so I'll send you a link for that later for the notes. And the That's idea, the first thing I wanted to talk about. Right. So the idea, as I understand it, is that there's water can be too empty, as you say. It needs a little mm -hmm. bit of um, impurities, salts, minerals to bind, to actually enhance the flavor of the coffee. And so people who have water that has these in it are lucky in that sense that they don't have to add anything. Is that right? 
Yeah, in fact, the first year I was making espresso, I was using just tap water. And it turns out there's way too much salt in it, which was really good for flavor. But in Honolulu, it's just like there's so much salt here. It's just surrounded by salt air, salt, the ocean. And so it was like five times the amount of recommended salt for my machine. And it's a stainless steel boiler. So like heat and salt and stainless steel equals a lot of corrosion, right? So, um, and pressure. So when I stripped it down, the water, my coffee just tasted terrible. But I, I knew my machine was safe. And that's what led me to this product. And oh, it's just something that everyone gets so obsessed over the machine, the machine, the machine. But really, it's just like these little things that people don't pay attention to. Right. Okay. That's a great lesson. So um, it's often the um, behavior, not just so much the tools. What do you do with that's them? That's right. right. So this – so. Uh, I know we're going to put a link in, but could you just say the name of this um, source of minerals again? Sure. Third wave water. And they sell Third them in small. Third wave water. But they're, what, the, what you get is a powder that has that salt. 100%. Stick. That's right. Yeah. It's a, it's a mix they have, and it's pretty good. So I've it comes in people, little packets. You add one to a gallon, yeah. and then that lasts you for a while. I've heard of people adding that when they do sparkling water for, to, make, to make basically mineral water. Oh, interesting. You know, like instead of buying Calistoga or stuff, which has minerals in them, they'll add mineral water packets to their sparkling water. It's the same idea. You're adding minerals to it for drinking. Yes. Salt is delicious. Um, so um, well, that's a great one. Um, what's another tool, Brian? All right. So like I said, people really get concerned about spending as much money as possible on their espresso machines. And I, the other thing I found out that nobody will tell you, well, only enthusiasts know this. I will say it's a total secret is that the grinder is way more important. And that is because a good grinder will be able to grind really finely. And this is, some people contest this last part of like, it will make all the particles uniform. Mm -hmm. So they'll all extract in a uniform way. Um, my friend who makes coffee grinders said, well, coffee is not uniform. The inside and the outside are, it's like a steak when you like broil it, right? Like the outside might be charred, the inside right. might be something else. And coffee can be like that. So now I'm, I'm not sure this, I'm not a scientist, obviously, but what I will tell you is the better your grinder, the harder it is to like really screw it up. And so... I went all the way down the rabbit hole and I got the grinder with the biggest burrs possible, large, high quality burrs are then put in these machines with high tolerances and you grind your coffee and my coffee again in this big machine that was made by this guy um, in his garage, with a huge waiting list. It tasted again, it tasted really flat. And my friend who is a scientist, he's a chemist and a cafe owner he explained that I had to go to like really great lengths to take this really flat coffee and spice it up. It was like, it was like a race car that needed full attention just to make <laughs> things work properly. And I could never get there because you had to go so fine and you had to go so hot temperature and you had to extract for so long that basically a bunch of stuff could go wrong unless you were like on point making your coffee with this, super finicky, you know, almost $4,000 grinder with hundred millimeter burrs. And I was like, dude, I can't do this before my first coffee. I can't be like that on point for my first coffee before my first coffee. <laughs> so I thought it was me for a year. I sold it and I got this grinder that I want to recommend um, called, uh, it's a Weber key. And it's by a former Apple guy who lives in Japan and he just like retired from Apple and he started geeking out on coffee and he starts started making really great grinders and he has a higher end grinder than this. But again, it's like one of these formula car things. This grinder I got is like an iPhone where it's just like, you don't have to think about it every day. My coffee is great. And it's really small footprint, which is important for these because they can be really big. Uh -huh. um, so I can screen share this, mach sure. this machine. It has one thing I want to show. What, what does this grinder do that the other Ferrari grinder didn't do? Well, the first thing I will say is that it has these, this burr by this, I think it's Italian company, Mazer. It's got these burrs and they're conical. And conical 
shaped burrs. It, it's a burr pattern that doesn't make everything exactly uniform. Uh -huh. And that somehow makes things taste peakier is what they say. So like you'll taste a more dramatic flavor profile. And I think because my water is really cleaned up, even with the packets, I, I prefer that. Um, so it's really good. But the thing that's, every time I put beans in this, the coffee is good. And the thing I like about this, there's a couple of things. You know, when you go to a cafe and you see this huge, what's called a hopper, plastic jug full of beans, and the barista will press a button and then it'll like spit some beans out. Well, those machines for cafes are meant for production. And espresso is an industrialized form of coffee. It's like you could just, instead of boiling a pot of water, every time someone make, makes an order or have a really old pot, you instantly can make it really fast. And that it was a, almost a business decision to do this kind of style of coffee back in the day. So this machine is designed for single dosing, which is you measure out and you put one set at a time and it doesn't hold a lot of old beans and grinds in, in it. It's called retention, which can sully your coffee. Because if you have old grinds in there, then that's a big place where flavors can get distorted. Um, so this is what the machine looks like. The other notable thing is it's really compact for something with burrs this big. And, you know, it's beautiful, it's quiet, and he's got some really clever things about it that I'll explain. And again, so, can you remind me the name of this? Um, what's the name of it? It's called the Weber Key. Weber Key, and okay. It's, it's, it's won some awards. I think the company name is Weber Workshops. The guy's uh -huh. name is Doug Weber. He worked on like, I think, uh, one of the early okay. iPods sure. at Apple. So and what let does me, it run uh, for? show you. How, how much does it cost? Uh, this, this was like a crowdfunded thing I got for $1,500, but okay. it's basically $2,000 now. Right. <clears throat> and it's like, if you get it, it'll last you a lifetime. Um, so certainly like I would, if I were starting over, I would get like a $500, $700 espresso machine and I would get this grinder because it's okay. much more important. The and grinder is more to, important than the machine. All right. Okay. The other thing that's cool about it, it has this thing called the magic tumbler. The magic tumbler does what espresso geeks usually have to do by hand. It does it automatically. Basically, this is, you see that metal paperclip thing on screen? It's like a paperclip that as the grinds get ground, it will stir the grinds and break up any clumps. Oh. And clumps will cause channeling and channeling is when the water is flowing unevenly through the puck. So okay. that's where the skill of a barista comes in where if you go really fine, static and static will cause clumping and then clumping, the water can't get to it. And so you have basically stuff um, diluting or brewing from sugars, fats, and all that good, delicious stuff, oils, um, acids, and then it gets the plant stuff in like almost like ashy taste. Mm. And this keeps an even extraction is what you're looking for in, in good coffee. So um, it only takes a super small amount of the ashy stuff. So like if you have a super small particle and a really big particle and they're being extracted, the small particle will quickly get through its good stuff. And then as you're still working your way to brew the bigger particles, the small particles will start releasing like, the plant material and like the minerals and the stuff that can be really strong tasting. Now, one of the things that we have not mastered as a uh, technologist is sensors for taste. The human tongue is just way outclasses any sensor. And so there's no way to really like the best sensor for what something tastes like will take two coffees, one terrible and one good. And it might say they're both really similar in taste but the human tongue can just take these differences and just split them to like the finest resolution. And that is why effort in coffee makes a big difference. Right. You get right. your extraction even. So this paper clip will stir, 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 stir. And then you can just take it from there, your grinds and, and you release basically right now um, you, you take the cup and you place it on your porter filter, which holds your grinds and puts them in the machine and you lift out the bottom and it just all neatly falls into your, into your porter filter. Mm -hmm. So it's like you've reduced a bunch of steps. There's right. just less stuff to mess up and then right. you tamp it and then you make your coffee. And it's just almost, it's as foolproof as espresso 
um, bean grinding has been for me. And I've had like four or five of these um, high class grinders. And they're usually really fussy and really messy. And this one for me has just been, um, you know, I, I, I can almost always find something to complain about as a former <laughs> critic about equipment. And this one I've been really happy with. So Well, that's, a, yeah, that's a great testimony. That's fantastic. Okay, so the Weber. Um, so yeah. um, I know that you um, have gotten into woodworking. Do you have um, a woodworking tool for us? I do. Um, and the tool is, is you. It's us. And I, and I think that's what um, I thought long and hard about how to present this because right before pandemic, I went to go see this uh, – Japanese woodworker. I'm fixing up an old house in Honolulu with Japanese design elements and doors and windows. And I wanted to build furniture and work on the house a little bit myself. So I went to upstate New York for three weeks to this school called Makuchi run by this guy named Jan uh, Jigar. And he basically has trained as an apprentice under someone who trained as an apprentice under someone who was a master TS builder in Japan. So that's the only or the most notable Sukiya tea house lineage that operates in the United States. And um, if you go to YouTube, there's all sorts of weird influencers who don't really know what they're talking about. And they have like a million followers. And it's really sad and really exciting because as a media person, you think you should be able to find everything on YouTube or, or Google it. And, there's this whole pocket of Japanese woodworking stuff. Like how do you make a Japanese bathtub or furo that does not exist on the internet? Hmm. And I always thought it was a huge opportunity. And recently I started to realize why it doesn't exist when my teacher came out for a month to build a garden gate with me for this house. And I'd been practicing two years by myself, but I've been every book I've been taking remote lessons. I've been, I've been hitting it pretty hard even by my standards, right? And that includes tooling up like a maniac. And what I realized when my teacher was here was there was so much basic stuff that you could just never learn in media. Like, for example, I noticed the way he held his chisel was something I would never come up with on my own. And really what you're talking about here is 1,200 years of people handing things down non-verbally in person, and it's a very nonverbal culture. And as a writer and editor, it's like a, this hobby has become like a Cohen because it's something you can't describe with words or learn remotely, not fully. And I love that. And at first I was trying to fight that, but now I've embraced it a little bit more. And it's given my mind a lot of peace because words can be a little bit of a trap. Mm -hmm. So I want to show you um, I'll show you a mortise. I'll show you a couple of photos from my teacher's visit, and then I'll, I'll give you an overview of the tools. And then I want to talk about something that we'll talk about some sharpening yeah. stones because sharpening is, is one of the things that I think, I think most Americans have no idea what sharp really is. Um, right. And I think that's sad because there's something meditative to it and spiritual to sharpening. Basically, I just realized at this very moment that I never would have, known about the way my teacher was holding his chisel mm -hmm. and he's using his knuckles as sort of a way that his when, when the cut is made he can still control it and uh i tried doing it and i got cramps because it was such a alien way to hold the chisel for me and i could just think about all the times i would make a cut and the chisel would just go out of control mm -hmm. and so you know this is really nuanced stuff that's completely analog and you can't you can't get all these details unless you're just around someone like that hours a day, like an apprentice would. So I'm going to seek more in-person training at the same time. Um, you can see my mortises on the left. <laughs> this is on the right. <laughs> and, you know, I'm pretty happy with mine uh -huh. you know, for two years in. This guy's been doing it for, you know, 20, 30 years. Uh -huh. And, uh, you know, he might have done it 10 times faster, probably. You know, like he did it really fast. It's probably really accurate. But, uh, you know, for me. I'm on a journey and uh, uh, I'm practicing the way that I, you know, I'm friends with his former apprentice and I just would ask him, you know, what kind of stuff did you work on? 
And it's very different from American style where all, all my friends who got into American woodworking immediately started getting these huge tools, uh, which I also have, I'm not judging anyone, uh, get huge tools and they would really depend on the machine being better and better and bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger and better and better. And, better. Mm -hmm. and you're basically a shop manager more in American woodworking. Whereas when you're doing hand tool work, even Western hand tool work, you become the tool and the skill is in you and the sensitivity is in you. And you start being able to see the difference between like 128th of an inch or 160, you know, a 64th of an inch. And it's really beautiful because, you know, I used to run wire cutter and when you're a leader, maybe in that organization with like 50 people, you have to make some decisions that affect the whole group and not just, and sometimes that means being a little bit less sensitive to individuals, but between like this kind of work and sharpening, um, I feel like I've gotten much more sensitive, which has really helped my parenting. And I really enjoy it. I really enjoy fostering sensitivity as opposed to fostering like a competitive, you know, running things, being a boss, decisiveness kind of thing. Right. I think what, probably one of the things you discover is that you don't need a lot of power to cut wood. You just need a lot of, discernment that the, uh, a small amount of power applied at exactly the right place. So this is like a Japanese chisel, you know, and I don't want to get into, I'm covering the, the maker's mark because um, one of my teachers, another teacher, I have many said, you know, each tool is a responsibility and you just don't want to have that much responsibility in the beginning. And some days I wouldn't get any work done. I'd be sorting tools, setting up tools. I'm good at setting up tools now, but too many tools. And I kind of worked through my relationship with tools through this practice too, where one tool that doesn't come out of the box set up at all, you need to form a relationship with that tool and shape it and set it up the way you want. And it's, it takes a lot of skill and sensitivity and then, then you have to sharpen it and keep it sharp. You have to sharpen all the time, Japanese woodworking. And you can have a really good tool that's not set up well and a really mediocre tool that's set up really well and you focused on and you used it all the time. You didn't jump around with lots of different tools because you have a gazillion of them. And that tool will be, will be better. And so that really trained me. I'm still a bit of a tool hound, but um, when my teacher was out here, he only has a few basic tools and he can build a whole house. We can build a whole timber frame from it. And it's, it's amazing. And this other guy, it's Andrew Hunter. He's a notable furniture maker. He still uses his very first tool he got when he was basically a beginner, but he's gotten it to this level. So like, who am I to need these really, you know, tools from blacksmiths 50 been dead for decades who no young person who's still alive has ever been able to replicate the hardness, the fineness, you know, it's durable and yet it's supple on the stones. It's, there's miraculous steel that you can, you can feel the difference on, but you know, if you're not using these tools eight hours a day, um, you don't really need that. And I would emphasize anyone who wants to get into this should go seek education. Um, I'll show you this. This is my first Japanese plane. And could you hold another, it? Up could you do that? Yeah. And it's basically just a block of Japanese wood. wood. Ja Japanese white oak of the European American varieties is, uh, it's more, fl it's more uh, flexible. So it holds the blade better, which is just a, a wedge of steel, uh -huh. iron, backed by a hard tool steel. And I'll explain that in a second. And uh, people cut these themselves. And so the bottoms aren't flat either. There's basically a point in the beginning where it touches and then it touches right before the blade and then it's relieved back here is a typical setup. And this is relieved by like a few thousandths of an inch. Hmm. And the reason why you do that is if there are bumps, it will just keep the plane more steady. Right, and right. it's really hard because wood moves with humidity changes. It's easier to keep these two points contact and parallel than it is to keep this whole thing flat. So why don't they make so, them out of metal like they do in the West? Well, Metal planes are good, but they're nowhere near as sensitive. You can't feel things. These can cut much finer and like they can make like a, like a wood will look like it's been sanded to the finest grit. Mm. And it's people who compete and take, um, are in contest to take thin shavings will do like a three, four micron shaving. It's incredible. I mean, that's what's human hair is like 50 microns. 
And, and they're so able to do that better with a wooden plane than with a steel plane. Yeah, for sure. It's, it's unbelievable what people do with these things. Um, yeah, there's a contest called Kezurakai, and uh, it's also the name of a nonprofit in the U.S. that is a good place to get online lessons. So uh, but talk, I'll tell you a little bit. About that. Let's talk about the uh, getting lessons. So Yeah, yeah. So, like, this plane um, – well, first, let me tell you about this steel a little bit. So, Japanese is it's hard steel and laminated to soft iron, and that makes sharpening easier because if the whole thing were super hard steel – it would be impossible to sharpen. I've, I've sharpened a blade like that by hand and it's, it's way too much work. So the soft iron makes things easier, you know? And uh, I've gotten really into sharpening stones. I've got dozens and dozens of sharpening stones and I love to try them all. And, and that's a thing. People get obsessed with just sharpening and not building. So that's another thing I could talk about the stones I got into that I think cool tools people would be into if they're into sharpening. Um, but I can also talk about lessons. Well, this is, well, this, okay. Let's talk about your stone. If you have a stone that you would recommend. Um, yeah. So what, what, what do you recommend? Okay. So in Japanese tools, there's an element that almost like flatness is sort of a, sort of a God. And that's because when you have two planes meeting, meaning like the, bevel of the blade and then the back of the blade the back should be flat and the bevel can also be flat or some people like them curved it depends what you're trying to do but my point is if you don't have the back flat what happens is the planes don't meet well or at all and you can't get that sharp and so what's valuable then is a stone that stays very flat Mm. and all stones have compromises between um, traditionally sharpening stones, man-made and otherwise. Well, the harder a stone is, sometimes it's too much hardness for the blade and will like scratch it up or it will be skittery when you're trying to sharpen on it. It won't be smooth sharpening experience. At the same time, if a stone is soft, it's easy to sharpen on, but it might round your blades. And so, these diamond stones are a really modern thing that people are using. And when I say diamond stone, I don't mean the hard metal plate that's coated in diamonds that people use to flatten stones. There's a stone that is basically a resin. So it's like a binder, like a, like epoxy or concrete or anything. And inside of that is grit of diamond. And they stay flat so long. It's amazing. And if you are trying to move a lot of metal, whether it's a knife or plane, anyone who sharpens and you need your stones to stay flat, these things are miraculous, but they're also intensely tricky to flatten because they will annihilate anything that tries to flatten them. (laughs) Yeah. It's like, what do you use to flatten them? Because they are themselves, you know, it's like, yeah, they're they're meant they're meant to wear down whatever it is that's supposed to flatten them, right? That's right. That's right. And so, my favorite stones um, are by this well-known company called Naniwa, and Naniwa makes lots of really good regular stones, water stones, synthetics, and their diamonds. They have a four hundred grit stone, which is fairly coarse, and I use it for setting up tools very quickly. Uh, when I have a lot of stuff to get through, like a new set of chisels or something. And the, the way that my friend, who's like a young man who discovered sharpening when he was like 13 and apprenticed when he was like 15 or 16 with like a, re- a world-class sharpener, he's like 26 now. And so he has the sharpening skills of an old man, but he's 26. And he taught me, you know, traditionally you would take a water stone, you would lap it with a diamond plate. So that water stone is flat like a thousand grit. And then you would take that and for a few moments, maybe five, 10 seconds or something depends, you would flatten one of these diamond resins. And it's just a, it's like a war of attrition. And before that gets too rounded, you go back and flatten your water stone. So you could then flatten your diamond stone. You do this, it could take, take forever, right? And so once you get it relatively flat, what I do is I have three of each and you rub them against each other in a round 
Mm-hmm. So three 400 grit Naniwas together will keep each other flat. It's, it's really slow. And so you, it's better to keep them flat than to take them out of flat by using them and then having to bring them back. Mm-hmm. But I'm, but I'm really in love with those stones because they are, let, let me put it this way. My teacher knew I had a good amount of tools. He was going to come out from New York to Hawaii. He didn't want to bring any tools. And I said, okay, this is not really traditional, but great. He can use my tools. He could tell me if they're set up well or not. turns out they weren't. That's a different story. And he said, well, there's one thing I will bring out if you don't have it. And he said, I'd bring out one of these diamond stones. Okay. <clears throat> so you know all it's like the coffee grinder there's tools right. people think are important but really it's the tools behind the tools that sometimes are more important right. and in this case it's it's these diamond stones were the one thing that he he thought he couldn't live without working right. here for a month so here i'm just going to put up this is the web page of the um the nani stone the naniwa diamond stone and they're it looks like they're around 200 dollars a piece and they look like a regular sharpening stone um, in terms of their format. So they're um, not a beginner stone. It's not what? a beginner stone. Not a beginner not, stone. Not a beginner stone. Right, 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 right. Yeah, no, I mean, I think I think first step is to learn how to use a regular stone and get as good as you can get that way before you would move to these. Yeah, you'll know when you need these. You'll know when they'll <laughs> save you hours and hours a day in setting uh, up tools. Yeah. Yeah. And when you say setting up tools, is that what you mean? You mean just sharpening them? No, setup is like you get something from a blacksmith and depending on the grade of tool, it won't be that refined. And some people think it's almost undignified to get them too refined, right? So it's like wearing too nice clothes or something, you know, having too fancy of a car, having tools that come right out of the box. On one hand, some people think that's not dignified. On the other hand, how much is your time worth as a working carpenter? So now that I know that I've been able to set up my cheaper tools that have good steel, but came really like the backs were out wavy or you have to get those things flat. You have to shape them and set them up and set them up with the right angles. You have to move a lot of steel, mostly by hand. So that can take, the chisel can take a couple hours. Mm-hmm. It's a lot of work. It's a big commitment to set up tools. And then from there, it's maintenance. You know, sharpening five minutes if you're good. You know, right. a couple minutes. Okay. So that's kind of what I meant. Yeah. Right. So, so you've several times you've mentioned and made it very clear that um, it may be more worth your while th- to invest into education learning than it is into the money and purchasing a high end tool. You can probably go further if you knew what you were doing with a medium end tool. And so you have some places if you're interested in say Japanese joinery or Japanese style woodworking or just woodworking in general, maybe um, some places to recommend as a place to learn. That's right. So there's two main places that I participate in and learn from. So my first I'll mention is Makuchi, which is um, it's upstate New York. And if you live on the East coast, it's worth a trip because it's not that far. Um, He's right on the corner in Port Jervis between like New York, Pennsylvania, New Jersey. So you can cross a bridge and there'll be fireworks superstores uh, in Pennsylvania. Like one, one, there were two fireworks superstores right next to each other. I'll never forget that. It must have really been competitive. But anyway. I have, I have a, uh, I think a picture here of Makuchi. Would that's right. The Japanese tradition. So this is like some, someone who offers uh, workshops and classes. Oh, yeah. But, but yeah. you need to be physically there, right? Well, I think once you get a foundation, online lessons can be good. Uh, because once you get past the fundamentals, there is a lot of design language that I think I found really helpful with. Because it's I prefer not to do something Japanese-y unless it's on purpose. I'd rather learn like what the proper proportions are uh, and have something that works. You know, I'm trying to build all the furniture in my house it's not upholstered so it's helpful because figuring out the design casually is a lot of time and energy and it's better to learn from the heritage i think someone who's learned from someone else and And as far as design and the craftsmanship as well 
Yeah, Jan is interesting because he didn't buy certain tools knowing they would lead to a career in building kitchen cabinets out of plywood. Mm-hmm. He didn't get the table saw. He has a band saw for, you know, dimensioning wood and milling wood. He has a joiner and a planer for, <clears throat> you know, dimensioning stuff and getting stuff mm-hmm. true. It's like, and then he's got a couple of like, you know, mortising tools that you would use in modern day in Japan to save some time. But by large, he is hand tool focused. And he's committed to that in a way that I find remarkable in a world. Mm -hmm. America punishes craftsmen. America punishes craftsmen Mm -hmm. and musicians and artists compared to other cultures. And I, when someone can make a living with hand tools, I find that extremely beautiful and impressive. Mm -hmm. And he, he, he watching him work for a couple of weeks was incredible, Mm -hmm. just incredible. And so that's, uh, that's who I learned from, and and you know, there's also what do, and so what do they? Uh, uh, so he offers classes. I'm just trying to get a sense of. Uh, looks like he has some. You can get studio classes where you you work with a group of people. Is that the idea? And there's a, um, is it a week right. only? Uh, or he has weekend training? stuff, or he has okay. intensives for a couple of days, and it you know okay. it starts with sharpening and tool setup, and it goes on to small projects and, you know, cutting certain joints that might be used in timber frame or furniture, making a shoji door window. Um, Okay. Yeah. All right. And, but I would imagine that he's probably not the only one offering um, such classes. Is that right? No, there's people who teach more on the West coast and online at this organization called Kezurakai, which I, I volunteer at. I help run their classes a little bit. And, uh, yeah, that's based out of Oakland, but they do zoom classes and that's really good right now. They do a lot of tool setup and they're trying to get more into technique. So Kezra Kai also, their main thing they do is not these classes. This is almost a pandemic response, mm-hmm. but they have an annual event. And in that event, you can see things in person and really talk to people and get introduced, um, and they have a board and the board's full of carpenters with lots of experience training in Japan and working here in, in Japan in some cases. And um, yeah, it's a beautiful practice. I wish it were more popular, you know, my, like my favorite woodworking magazine that's been operating for decades has maybe like 10 articles on Japanese woodworking and find maybe work- two on Chinese woodworking, which is a whole nother thing. Yeah. It's uh, even more impenetrable. Right. <laughs> yeah. Fine woodworking. Yeah. Um, yeah, you know, the, the, there is, I mean, if you go to Japan, there is in the temples and stuff, people who are still practicing this on a day to day basis. They're not, you know, they're not revered as national living treasures. They're just working contractors, you know, who show yeah. up with their tools and, and do it. And there are even parts, as you mentioned, in China, um, in the southern part of China, in the um, Dong area, where they, make homes without nails completely jointed um, wood jointed um, construction um, and those guys are you know they're what's the word I want um, they are craftsmen but they're not optimizing for um, museum quality they are trying to make a living right you know, they're, they're, they're dealing with you know time versus um, uh, effort. And so, um, but you can see them, you can see what it looks like in a kind of a working level where they're using these same kind of tools on a commercial basis. I love it. Where they're going to put up a house and they have a week to do it, whatever it is. And they're going to, they're going to make the joints. And most of the tools are made locally by, by local blacksmiths. You're going to help me find a, a Chinese furniture teacher in like Taiwan or something. We're going to do this. Oh, wow. That'd be great. Be great. Yeah. yeah. We got to find it. Got to do it. Yeah. So, um, um, so this last one you mentioned, do they, they do have some online courses? Mm-hmm. Yeah. And they're a great place to start, you know, cause you can fumble around for a while. It's almost part of the, part of the fun is fumbling around. Right. Uh, you know, I, I waited two years to go back to my first teacher. I really went as far as I could without him. And I think he knows that I went extremely far. 
I did everything I possibly could digitally. Let's put it that way. Right. Um, and then I came back to him and it was like, I could see the futility. It was really humbling to know, you know, I was really happy when he told me that some of the stuff I sharpened wasn't that sharp, but then some of it he said was almost too sharp. And that's, that's, I didn't know if I was sharp or not because I don't have anyone to compare to. Right. And then there was all this stuff that he's like, you know, you're a beginner in some ways and in some ways you're not. And that's just because I wasn't learning from it. Right, 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 right. And the kinds of things that you're making with the tools, once you get them sharp, uh, you're making furniture. Yeah. You know, it's a, I'm restoring this house and my shop is in the house and we're about to double the shop. And so all my stuff is half boxed up and it's really difficult work working here right now. I'm building shoji tracks uh, for a closet because, and I'm learning how to integrate Japanese shoji tracks and that whole jam system into a Western construction. I see. So the Finnish carpenter and I are both like, how does this mean? And I'm learning Finnish carpentry and uh, I'm building a couple of lamps and, you know, a slab table for the kitchen. And uh, what else am I doing? Yeah. I'm just building things here and there, little things. And usually it's sliding door systems. I'm like specified because it's not something that's really well codified uh, with American carpenters, especially plywood boxes. How do you build tracks? To them? Right. So, right. Yeah. For it's people who don't know, the, the sliding doors is sort of the, um, what you meant by showed you door, right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, they, they are, they have to be precise in a way. And um, because, yeah, because of there's no hardware, it's, it's all wood. So yeah. they're kind of amazing that they work. Um, so, so it sounds, so, so, with your journey into hand tools and um, sharpening and using the tools, do you have any other kind of suggestions about somebody who's beginning? Um, several times yes. you mentioned how, how deep you've gone. You, you, I think the average person gets to choose maybe two or three places to go deep and the rest you kind of have to skate over a little bit. Um, do you have any suggestions about somebody who is interested in maybe taking a step towards more of the hand tool and less of a power tool version of the world. Where do you think they start? Do you go to YouTube and start to consume at that level? Do you just buy a couple tools from Harbor Freight and mess them up as you try to learn? Or what, what, what would you suggest? There are two major, by major, I mean, they know what they're talking about and you can depend on them. They're not big by any means, they're very small two stores in the U S where people usually start buying the tools. One is Suzuki tools. Um, that's better Google. I don't know what the exact URL is and they can connect you with pretty good tools and give you an, a head start towards where to find a teacher, maybe near you, um, one of our other customers. And then there's Hida tool. They're both in the Bay area, of course, and they have good tools too. And it's just a good place to start. You, know, you just get a few things and you can go from there. I kind of think YouTube is not the best place to go. But these other resources just know so much more. The influencers just, they just don't have access to what's going on. Like for example, my teacher was out here and we just looked at wood for two weeks. And he told me about, if you know the way the wood's gonna dry and bow, you orient the wood that way in the pieces. Most American woodworkers these days are not paying attention to that stuff. So with the shoji track, you want all the wood to bow so the doors don't seize, get seized on by the jams. But for the doors, you want the wood to be a heart side in because heart wood is more fussy. It's like a teenager. It can mm -hmm. like come up and splinter more and it's usually coarser. And But when it dries, the whole thing gets tighter. And so there aren't rules normally. You just have to know what the use case and context is. And yeah, I've just never heard American woodworkers emphasize the orientation of the tree and the work and how that's totally functional. Mm -hmm. So that's just one example of something that you'll never get on YouTube. Mm -hmm. You just won't. And it's one of the fundamental things. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, it's basically the other thing I would say is I had so many fellow um, media people pick up woodworking during the beginning of the pandemic 
and they did not ask an apprentice how they learned. And they all went for these big oak benches and they all got destroyed by those projects and quit because how can you build a huge thing like this without knowing the fundamental things of like how to get sharp and how to cut a joint. And so I did fundamentals. I just did mortise and tenon and sharpened. I did it too much, I would say, but I have a very strong, I'm confident in saying it's a strong base I have. Um, so, so you would suggest a beginner start with fundamentals, just learn some basic sharpening, basic, how do you make a, you know, box, a joint. Yeah. And then make a box. Just, yeah. Make a box again and again, wax yeah. on, wax off. It's totally that. And it's honestly, your ego has to be able to handle it. It's like Jiro Jeans of Sushi making rice for decades. And, you know, I used to think, I think an American brain would think that's an oppressive way to learn. Oh, it's so boring doing the same thing over and over. But it's really gentle because I'm here struggling to learn over the last two years before I got back to my teacher. So many things, I learned them all so shallowly and it's terrifying. It's really hostile. It's being cast into a world, expect to meet professional expectations if you're working or just trying not to ruin tools and wood if you're not. And it's brutal. You can't get good that way. Mm -hmm. The old ways of learning, which I know you know all about and think about from all your travels mm -hmm. are beautiful. And it's very sheltering to make <clears throat> a new person stick to the fundamentals and not have too much pressure. Yeah. It makes the work better too for the whoever the customer is or whoever the work is for, whether it's a temple or a patron, they don't have to have apprentice work marring their project. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So um, I guess the larger theme of what you're talking about is to find mentors, find someone that you can find masters that you can learn from by working with them, seeing how they work, seeing how they actually hold a tool and um, yeah. have them correct uh, you and help you with your fundamentals. Um, it'd be really, you know, we're fortunate in the Bay area to have some people, but there are people who live far from these kinds of centers and um, they might be able to save up enough to make a journey and take a workshop, but it would be great if there was resources that allowed some kind of mentoring to happen at a distance. Uh, yeah. And not just, of course, we're not just talking about woodworking either. There's plenty of other crafts that this dynamic also is at work in. If someone's going to be casual, you can learn online, take some Zoom classes. I've, I've tried to get this nonprofit to do rentals, but they're not ready for it. It's a little too, uh, it's a little scary for them. Yeah. And uh, I respect being conservative on how they try to teach. I'm fine with that. I totally respect it. And I think that's good enough for most people. Frankly, it's not good enough for me. So I'm going to keep having my teacher come out and going to fly places. And I have that luxury. That's, that's what I want to spend my time and resources. on. Right, right. Yeah, no, I mean, I think for, for me, what I found is that the best way to begin is just to make things. Is yeah. You make them wrong. Okay, they don't last long. You learn a lot. You make it better. But I find that making things is worth worth more than a workshop worth more than online watching videos and like you you get to a point in making things where you just where you realize that you're ready to learn the real thing 100% and then okay then i need then i need to someone needs to show me and i and maybe correct me and start me again but i am now ready to do that and so for me the path to learning is always doing. It is. It is. And I think that for me, my, my anxiety around having the right tools and being ready, I got to work through it because I needed that security of having good tools or I thought I did. And then I watched all these amazing people I met through Kezarakai and Mokuchi that were just building amazing things with whatever. Some right. people, some some there's this one guy who's a really good carpenter in my community and he just buys an Amazon plane and he just works with it just to show people that you can buy a $50 plane. I'm, I'm not recommending that because sometimes they come and they're just unworkable and just you're wasting time <laughs> building relationship with the wrong tool, you know? Uh, but then there's like, there's tools that are from those two dealers I told you about. Yeah. 
and you could use those for the rest of your life yeah. and, and be okay. You, you kind of, in talking to you, Brian, I got this idea of a great tour to lead which would be to, you know, a craftsman tour where you go and visit these, again, these kind of commercial working guys in Japan or China or, you know, other places um, where they're doing this on a, you know, kind of a commercial basis. And they're working with these hand tools and they're building entire homes with a chisel and a hammer and a saw and some ink string, you know, I mean, it's, it's amazing. And let's do it. Uh, that would be that would be a really cool thing to have like you know a dozen avid woodworker types who are ready to to see this and you could go to places that way 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 off the tourist track where they're doing this in a, in a, a real fashion and and i it just occurred to me that would be a fantastic um experience i think like, so too you know, like, um, I don't know, the number of little forges I've seen in, say, Miramar, <clears throat> or there, I, I have, I should grab a, this beautiful scissors that were handmade, hand forged with a, you know, with, with a guy with a hammer forging scissors and tongs and stuff. And of course, he has this coal furnace, a little tiny furnace this big that he's working on barefoot. That's always the thing that gets me. These blacksmiths who are who are working barefoot, ah, but they produce amazing things with the simple tools that they have, um, making tools as well. Yeah, yeah. No, it's okay. really special. Well, um, yeah. once once everything opens, I think we'll I'll get back to you and we'll think about and maybe other people here would be interested in joining it. I think it's a great idea. Yeah. yeah. Well, um, Brian, is there anything else you wanted to share with? Um... Yeah, I want to say one thing, which is this has really changed my life because I've been a professional critic for 20 years and you're not aware of how that changes your brain. To be critical and judgmental of so many things is just a way of life and the way you make money. And, and um, I remember asking one really good old carpenter who sold me a bunch of his tools and you could tell he just wanted some, a good home for them. He was selling them for not what he could get for them. He didn't want to sell them to collectors. Uh-huh. And, uh, and I'm like, well, how do you feel about this Smith? I've heard that some people think his work's kind of soft. And, and he was like, Oh, I don't know. They're all good enough. You know, he had fantastic tools, but at the same time, he, he didn't care to bad mouth any other yeah. of the mediocre tools. And he goes, you know, just a craftsman would never criticize another craftsman oh. and i you know like from the very moment i'm every single thing i make no matter how hard i try is really screwed up it's got the last project i made was rushing and i made one cut at the wrong setting so it was too deep and cut into a tenon it's like i shim i i shoved some wood in there and i glued it and i'm like and then i was fitting some piece and i was holding the tenon i snapped it off because it was like redwood it was a huge tenon i fixed it but I snapped off a whole tenon, man. That's, that's like, that has to be strong, you know? <laughs> I fixed it. I fixed it. It's stronger than it, it became stronger than it was in the first place. But that's another story. That's, that's experience that I'm finally getting a little bit of. But uh, how could I judge? How could yeah. I judge anybody? How could I complain about my tools when my teacher is making world-class furniture with his first plane? Yeah. Who am I? Yeah. Just... And to shut up that part of my brain and just make peace with it has made me so much happier with my, my partner, my, my child. I'm like the most type B parent. I just don't, for a type A person to like let go of that, but it takes resources and time and, you know, therapy and, but craft was a huge part of it. And I believe it's what I get, the feeling I get when I make things, even the stupidest little thing, like I made this saw cabinet from like Home Depot Redwood. Uh-huh. I think it's pretty good. Right? I'm happy with it. It's like, yeah, it looks great. You know? Yeah. 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 It's I'm happy with it, but I can, I know where all the flaws are, but from ten, five feet away, you can't see. That is the opposite feeling you get from doom scrolling Facebook with political comments and like all the anger, the lack of emotional awareness and sensitivity uh-huh. and, and, and intelligence. I think craft can save America. I really do. It's wow. just such an incredible thing that I came upon. 
I I would like to end it there. Craft can save the world. Yeah. That's really cool. Well, thank you, Brian. It's really wonderful. And I agree. And I think you're onto something. And um, I'm so glad that we had a chance to reconnect. And thank you for taking time to share your passion for this craft with others. It really is important. Thank you. We're glad that you enjoyed this issue of the Cool Tools Show and Tell. Just want to remind you that we have some other coolish material on our YouTube channel here. Please subscribe, comment, like. In addition, um, this Cool Tools Show and Tell is also available in an Audible podcast form. You can subscribe to it wherever you subscribe to other podcasts if you just wanted to listen. And if you're listening, know that there is a visual version of this on our YouTube channel where we're actually showing the tools and um, there's a little bit more of a visual component there. In addition, the same folks that put us, uh, the Cool Tools website out, we also put out a free newsletter every week. It's very, very short. It's one page or less. We recommend six very brief items um, that are very succinct, easy to read. You can deal with it in a couple minutes. And every week we bring to you the six cool things that we have uncovered and want to share. And it's called Recommendo with one M, recommendo.com. You'll be able to find it there. It's free. Join 50,000 plus other subscribers every Sunday morning. You'll get it in your email box. And it's actually one of the most popular things that we produce. But we do produce other newsletters as well. One of them is called What's in Your Bag. We have one that goes out to um, tools and tips for your workshop. So you can get those at our website, um, and they are also free. And finally, um, I want to mention the fact that um, we do have a Patreon, and um, this uh, podcast and this vidcast are supported by Patreon supporters. The minimum is a dollar a month. And for that, you get um, an email to ask us anything. We'll respond and um, answer your question if we're able to. There are other higher levels. You can all see those at our Patreon page. And all those links are below right here. So thank you again for being a fan. And um, we'll keep producing stuff if you enjoy it. Thanks. We are grateful for all our Patreon supporters. And this week's include Randy Fisher, Bob K, Hans Reisbeck, Michael Douglas, Andrew Nepley, Chris Wurstuk, Dan O'Brien, Michael Jones, Chris Wayland, and Pamela Cooley. We give thanks to each of you and appreciate your support. Thank you.